Hot cross buns, hot cross buns, one a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. Roll that theme tune! Hey, home bakers, a hot cross bun is a classic Great British Easter sweet treat. It's a spiced, fragrant, fruit filled, sticky soft bun with a cross on the top. Eat it fresh and warm with butter or split and toasted with butter. But whichever way you have it, be sure to serve it up with a nice steaming cup of fine English tea. Oh yeah, cut to the table. The first thing to do with a little forethought is to soak your dried fruit. Here I have 75 grams each of sultanas and raisins. Cover with just enough water and leave them to soak. A couple of hours will probably suffice, but I like to leave them overnight for maximum moisture absorption and super juicy fruit in the final bun. The following day, as you can see, they have soaked up nearly all of the water in the bowl and plumped up lovely. Take them to the sink and drain them in a sieve and spread them out on a kitchen paper lined tray. The idea here is not to remove all the moisture that we spent all night soaking up, just to pat off the excess moisture on the outside because it's that that will make things a little bit slippery and a little bit tricky to incorporate the fruit into the final dough later on. Spread them out, shake them around, put some paper on the top and gently pat. Don't squeeze and set aside for later. Hot cross buns are made with a classic enriched bread dough, a bun dough, if you will. And this recipe makes 12. So here in my large mixing bowl, I'm adding 265 grams of milk that I've warmed to between 25 to 30 degrees C or 77 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. You'll know by now that I always normally recommend room temperature liquid uh, for a room temperature dough, especially for beginners. But this is an enriched dough, remember? We've got butter, milk, eggs, sugar, and a whole ton of fruit. And all this stuff is weighing it down and slowing down the puff. So I always like to start with a little bit warmer liquid in the beginning. The flip side to making a warm dough is we need to pay a little bit more care and attention later down the line, take some specific steps to ensure it doesn't dry out too much. We'll talk about this later. Add a medium egg, that's 50 grams of egg for us here in the UK, and 14 grams of dry, fine powdered, fast action, easy bake, whatever you wanna call it, yeast. Whisk everything together to soften the yeast nicely. Next, add 500 grams of strong white bread flour, 60 grams of golden or regular caster sugar. That's super fine sugar, I believe that you call it in the US. And eight grams of fine sea salt. This whole recipe will be on my blog that I'll link up underneath for you. And also it features in my book, which comes out on May the 5th, uh, which at the time of recording, is about four weeks away, I believe. Not long now. Whenever you watch this, there is a link underneath to purchase a copy if you so wish. I would. I think it's wicked. I think you're gonna love it. Shall I leave it there? Or is that too much? Next up is very important, is spice. Mixed spice first, two tablespoons. And yes, I know it looks like a lot, but yes, I do mean two tablespoons. Mixed spice, by the way, if it's not commonplace where you live, is a blend of spices and is wicked delicious. It contains Cinnamon, coriander seeds, dill seeds, ginger, cloves, and nutmeg. It's not the same as allspice, which I believe is some sort of pepper. So don't swap it out for allspice. It's completely different to mixed spice. I'm not sure how easy this is to get hold of all over the globe. And if you have some tips in your area, please feel free to drop a comment for the rest of us. An additional teaspoon of cinnamon is required also for a fragrant booster. And then we can mix everything together in a classic way with your Bake With Jack dough scraper. Mix it, turn it, cut into it with a curved edge to really get all that moisture into the flour, or all the flour into the moisture, depending on how you look at it. When there is no dry flour left, but the dough still is kind of raggedy, add 50 grams of cubed room temperature butter and kind of dimple it in with your fingertips. Then get out onto the table and knead with zero flour. Come on, you know this by now, right? No flour when you're kneading, total game changer. Here, as I do this, you'll notice I get into a sticky and buttery mess. This is normal and it's only for a little while, okay? So stay strong. 
Continue using the flat side of your scraper to clean your table every once in a while and bring everything together to avoid the use of additional flour. I'm always conscious that whenever I'm demonstrating kneading or certainly on a video, it looks like I'm really putting some force and strength into it, but I'm really not. 10 minutes of light, physical action, pushing, rolling, folding back on itself is all that's needed to develop that gluten nicely. Usually eight minutes, but for bundos, I like to give it the extra two for good measure. Set yourself a timer and that way it's not a race, is it? You don't have to do it quickly because 10 minutes always passes uh, after 10 minutes, right? Your dough will become smooth and bouncy. Trust the process and when the timer is done, stop. Employ the cup and turn technique to help coax it into a ball shape. Pop an upturned bowl on top to prevent any risk of it drying out while it rests here for five to 10 minutes. Remember your dough has been under a lot of stress here. It is tense and tight. It just requires a little bit of time just to relax slightly, to release a bit of that tension. And that makes the next part, which is incorporating the fruit much easier. After that short rest, dust your dough very lightly, yes. This is acceptable now at this stage. It's okay, relax. And use a rolling pin to roll it into a disc with a diameter, roughly 30 centimeters, just like pastry. Move the dough around the table every once in a while, picking up a little bit of flour underneath to make sure nothing sticks to the table. When you're ready, remove the paper from your fruit. And I'm adding to that 75 grams of cut mixed candied peel. Mix it together on a tray here with your scraper. Push out your dough slightly, pile half your fruit on top, and spread it out evenly on a surface. The idea here is to get a little bit of fruit everywhere throughout the dough. So we're gonna do this in two stages. The first one we're gonna do, we're gonna fold it. The second one, we're gonna roll it, and then we should have achieved what we set out to achieve. Use your fingertips to kind of poke and press it in, not too firmly, because we don't wanna break the fruit and get in a slippery mess. Fold your dough in three parts, the bottom part up and the top part up and over that. Then dimple it down again with your fingers. Turn it portrait to you and flatten slightly with your fingers once again. Scoop up the rest of the fruit, get it on top, spread it all around right to the edges and dimple that in too. Oh, this part is really pleasing. So take your time here and enjoy it. Let's linger here for a little bit, shall we? This time starting from the top, we'll give it a little fold and now employing the roll push, roll push, roll push procedure all the way to the bottom that we all know and love. We can roll it up Swiss roll styly. If any fruit falls out, don't stress, just poke it back in. Another little cup and turn to round things off and pop it back into the bowl. After a little dusting, place an upturned bowl on the top and leave it to rest for one and a half to two hours to puff up really nice. In the past, you'd have seen me cover my dough with a dry cloth of some description like I normally do, but here we make an exception for two reasons. Firstly, we make an enriched dough here, which I feel like dries out faster than anything else. And secondly, remember earlier, when I said we warm the milk up to give it a booster, that is slightly risky because a warm dough in a cooler place is gonna wanna dry out on its own the moisture inside will be trying to leave. And we need to compensate for that by creating some kind of airtight cover, whether it's an upturned bowl like this or some dusted cling film, which we're gonna use on the second puff. After resting, your dough should have clear signs of puffing up like this one. Turn it out of the bowl, upside down. And if you'd like your buns to be all exactly the same size, you need to weigh the dough as a whole and divide the weight by 12, which I am doing here. Roughly, that will make them about 100 grams of dough per piece. But remember, this all kind of depends on how much moisture your fruit soaked up in the first place, which might make yours slightly more or slightly less. So if you do want to get them the same, it's well worth weighing the whole, divide it up on a calculator and go from there. Use your fingers and knuckles to press your dough down flat and the straight edge of your scraper to divide it up into 12 pieces, weighing them as you go if you are that way inclined. Line them up in order in a pleasing fashion. If you have anything left over at the end, Roll it into a little sausage, cut it into tiny pieces, and add a little piece to each bun. Next, get yourself a tray and line it with parchment paper. This one is an enamel baking dish that Falcon sent to me. Isn't that lovely? Thank you very much. At the top, at its widest, it measures 35 centimeters by 28 centimeters. 
Any tray around that size will be fine. It's not essential that the buns go all the way to the edge of the tray. So if you've got a bigger tray, well that's cool too. Now to shape these up one by one, take a piece which should still be sticky side up from earlier. Push a little with your fingers to flatten and pinch and fold the edges over the top all the way around to create your ball foundations. Here, the idea is to fold the stickiness and all the fruit inside. Roll it over so it's smooth side up now and cup your hand over the top with a kind of claw grip. Keep your hand steady and move in big circles. A combination of grip on the table and pressure from the sides from your hands is what's gonna tighten your ball up into a nice tight bouncy ball of dough. Let's see a second one uh, in ASMR mode, shall we? In an ideal world, this is exactly how we would shape up all our 12 buns, but there's a lot of fruit in here and potentially additional moisture that will stitch us up. So let's watch one that didn't go quite to plan and I can show you exactly what to do with it. This bun has a lot of fruit on the outside, right? But theoretically, the underside is still intact and not sticky. So fire everything in as normal, turn it over and roll. Some fruit is falling out, don't stress, things are tightening up but it is getting sticky. There's a lot of fruit gathering on the bottom of this bun and we're still in a bit of a mess. So a little dust is needed on the table to get things going again and I'll put the bun back down upside down again. Now, another little press and a second attempt to fold that stickiness inside will help as well as a little roll in the palm this time and we should be good to go. I was quite lucky with my buns and this proved to be the most troublesome one, but sometimes they get properly sticky, all the fruit busts out and it gets a real sticky mess. If that happens to you, pop it to one side, leave it to one side, let it rest up, shape all the rest of your buns. By the time to come back to it, be a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more dry on the surface and you'll be able to repeat the maneuver and hopefully get all that fruit and stickiness inside with a nice smooth round top. Finish them all and line up your buns in a tray. This time we're gonna cover with dusted cling film. So peel off a few slices and layer them up, dust them nicely and drape over the top to prevent things drying out while your buns rest and puff up for the final time. One and a half to two hours. While you wait, you've got three jobs to do. The first is to mix up your cross mixture, which consists of equal parts flour and water, 50 grams of each. I like to put a little pinch of sugar in here to make things more palatable. Theoretically, we want a nice white cross on the background of a golden bun, and the sugar does put things at risk of caramelizing on that cross and bring in a little bit of brown color. However, I always put a little bit in because it's just a bit more tasty than just a paste of flour and water on the top. Mix it up in into a paste and pop it in a piping bag. Scrape down the mixture to the tip of the bag with a scraper and tie it up all nice and neat and ready to go for later, yeah. For the sticky glaze, which is also essential, I like to use marmalade straight from the jar. So your second job is to loosen three tablespoons of your chosen marmalade in a bowl. And lastly, during this period, you're gonna to wanna to get ready for baking. So preheat your oven to 180 degrees C, that's 356 degrees Fahrenheit. Fan oven, by the way, with a shelf in the middle, empty and ready to go, and a deep roasting tray at the bottom. And also, half fill a kettle of water, ready to make steam later on. After your buns have rested, remove the cling film and you should be witnessing clear evidence of the most triumphant puff. I left mine for the full two hours here and it's well worth the wait to make sure your buns are as light and fluffy as possible. If it's cooler where you are, it might take longer, but I know that you already know. Carefully pipe a cross across the top of each bun. Because it's flour and water, it will have some elasticity to it. So you, I suppose you're kind of slowly draping a ribbon of the mixture over each bun, if you will. Enjoy this part. Take your time and don't rush through it because it's yet another pleasing part of the process. Yeah, see, told you. Now that they're all done, bring them to the oven and boil the kettle. Open the oven door, load your buns into that middle shelf and tip the water from the kettle into the shelf below. Shut the door containing that big sizzle of steam. All ovens are different, so set your time for 20 minutes to remind you to take a peep and then bake for the further five minutes if you feel like you need it. I did. And here they are fully baked in all their glory, but we're not done yet. No, 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 no. Slide the buns out of the tray onto a cooling rack. Slide the paper out from underneath and place it underneath the rack to catch the drips 
while you generously apply an even coating of the marmalade all over the top of each hot and golden bun with a pastry brush. Remember, bread, all bread, and buns like these may take some sweet, sweet time start to finish. But in terms of actual work for us, there really isn't much to it. So in these moments when you are required to do something, take it. Just like piping a cross mixture, take your time here, paint each bun carefully, get in all the nooks and the crannies and go right to the edges while your warm buns fill your home with the delicious aroma of those fragrant, sweet, spices man oh yeah you know what i'm talking about yeah and there they are let them cool if you can bear it and when you're ready just slice through that top crust to make sure they don't all unravel as you tear them apart gloriously soft and sticky fruit filled hot cross buns are completely achievable in your oven at home this easter slice them butter them well share them with your friends family and neighbors. There are certain things that when you make them at home are head and shoulders above anything you can buy in your local supermarket. And this is one of those things. This is one so much so that it's almost a completely different product entirely. And when you make your own and you eat it, you start thinking to yourself, what is that stuff in a plastic bag in a supermarket they sell me? Cause it ain't this. They are wicked delicious and well worth it. I'll pop a link for the recipe for this in the description box. And of course, it is in the Bake with Jack book, bread every day, uh, alongside a 30 odd other bread recipes for you to enjoy, plus tons of recipes of things to do with it and things to make of it, including turning an old hot cross bun into a pretty spectacular dessert. If you wanna pre-order this or order it, depending on when you are watching this video, I'll leave the link underneath and I hope you really love it. Enjoy your hot cross buns this Easter and I hope you get just as much value out of the process and the product because I sure do, man. Woo! See ya. Bye-bye.